Hello class, it's Melissa Parker, instructor at Guernic Academy for the prereqs course. Today we're going to go over lecture nine. Energy in versus energy out. So our bodies need a certain amount of ATPs to run. So that could be to transport molecules in and out of the cells, to breathe, to pump our heart, to aid in digestion. Um, so what happens if we consume above what is required? So if we have a surplus of macronutrients, so what happens if we eat too many carbohydrates and our body doesn't use all that, or fats or proteins? So when carbohydrates are eaten, the body undergoes the following steps to metabolically process them. First, we have digestion. So the amylose and the amylopectins get broken down into individual glucose molecules in the gut. So remember, amylose is starch and amylopectin are polysaccharides. Those are molecules that are found in plants. Then absorption happens. So the glucose enters into the bloodstream and then assimilation is where the tissue cells pick up the glucose from the blood with the help of insulin um, to use as fuel. So once glucose is inside the cells, the cells will use only enough glucose to make the ATP molecules as needed at that very moment, but not more. Cells can store some glucose as glycogen, and glycogen is a chain of glucose molecules, but they're branched, and it's stored in the skeletal muscles and then also in our liver. Um, so remember, glycogen, that term is stored glucose. So glycogen is a lot like starch, but it's branched, um, and then that is something that we store in our skeletal muscle and our liver um, for later use, like in time. During times of fasting, so like when we're sleeping or when we're waiting for our next meal. So the process of putting together molecules or um, of glucose to make glycogen is called glycogenesis. So remember the term genesis means creation, glycos referring to glycogen. So for each pound of glycogen, the body retains four pounds of water due to the water molecules being trapped in the branches of the glycogen. So the average human body can store about two pounds of glycogen. So that means that with that two pounds, we also have eight pounds of water. So this is a total of 10 pounds of weight that is retained. Um, so fatty acids um, are formed with excess carbohydrates. So once we've maxed out that glycogen reserve or storage, the rest of it's going to be turned into fat. So after after all, or after making all those ATPs needed with the glucose, and the two pounds of glycogen are already in place and there's still glucose left over, the rest of the glucose is turned into pyruvates and it's done so by glycolysis. So that's anaerobic. And then the pyruvate can be turned into acetyl groups. And then the acetyl groups are then attached together to form fatty, fatty acids. So if, um, if you remember beta oxidation, that's what they're talking about there. So we have glucose. Glucose can be changed to pyruvate. And then the pyruvate can be changed to the acetyl group in the presence of oxygen. And then the, those acetyl groups can then be changed into fatty acids. So this is that map that we've used before where we start with our glucose molecules that are those six chains carbons. They can go through glycolysis where you'll end up with the pyruvates, which are these three carbon chain molecules that you'll see right here. And then with oxygen, we can change those into acetyls. And through fatty acid synthesis, we can then change that into a fatty acid or through beta oxidation. reverse beta oxidation actually, because beta oxidation is where we take the fatty acid and convert it into the acetyls. But reverse beta oxidation is where we take the acetyls and then we change them into the um, fatty acids. 
So you recall that three fatty acids and a glycerol that makes a triglyceride. Um, so fat is stored in adipocytes. So adipocytes are fat cells. So this means that when the body has used enough glucose for ATP and its glycogen stores have been maxed out, all the extra glucose gets turned into fat. So there's no limit to how much fat can be stored in our body. No limit, okay? So the summary of what our cells can do with glucose. One, we can make ATPs, either aerobic or anaerobic. We can convert it into glycogen, but there's a max, right? A ma a, on average, about two pounds. And then option three is to convert the remainder into fat. And then there's no limit to how much fat that our body can reserve. So when fat is put into the body, the cells have limited options to what it can do with fat. So option one is we can hydrolyze the triglycerides into three fatty acids and a glycerol molecule. The fatty acids can be broken down into the acetyl groups by beta oxidation, and then they can then be put through the Krebs cycle and the ETC to make ATP molecules. So remember, this is possible only in the presence of oxygen, and fat can be metabolized or burned only aerobically. Option two is do nothing and then store the fat as is in the adipose sites. So note, it doesn't cost the body any energy or effort to make fat. Surplus of dietary fat. So the body can store a lot of fat because there's no limit to how much the fat, how much uh, fat we can store in our bodies. So fat is an efficient way to carry around extra fuel. Fat is very calorically dense, meaning there's a lot of calories inside of that fat, meaning we it's a lot of energy. So more calories per gram than carbs or protein, and it has a low mass density. So it's lighter than water, um, glycogen, or the muscle protein. So if you've ever seen somebody that's kind of on the heavier side, if they get in the pool, they tend to float a little bit better than those people that are lean, and that's because fat floats on the water. So a surplus of dietary protein. So when extra protein is eaten, extra amino acids are being brought into the body. Thus, the surplus of proteins is a surplus of amino acids. So amino acids are not meant to be used as fuel. However, if our cells have no choice, they will use amino acids for fuel or purposes other than building new proteins. So you guys have this too on um, page six. It's important for you guys to remember this. So note, our cells never store amino acids or proteins for the future. Remember, we only use what we need at that very moment. Our cells never make more proteins than necessary for each particular function at a time. And the cells use only enough amino acids to build as much of every kind of protein as necessary, even muscle protein, but not more. Okay, so surplus of dietary protein. <clears throat> if, it, <clears throat> if there's no need to build more muscle mass, the body will not build bigger muscles. <clears throat> Excuse me, to put on more muscle mass, you need to challenge your muscles. Your brain will get the message that your current muscle mass is inadequate and you need to build more muscle. So sometimes we see bodybuilders, they consume more protein. Well, that's because they're challenging their muscles and they do need more protein because they're tearing their muscles down and they need that protein to build it back up. But just eating the protein alone is not gonna put muscle on the body. You have to work those muscles out. You literally have to feel the burn the next day. So sometimes our bodies can become um, adjusted to the amount of work we're doing. And then you'll notice that you stop building muscle, you stop losing weight. So when that happens, you have to change up your routine a little bit, change what you're doing. So um, you wanna do something different. So that could be more reps when you're working with weights. It could be adding on more weight, but the purpose is to try to feel the burn. The burn means that you're tearing those muscles down that 
pain stimulates to the brain that you need more muscle in that area and you end up building more muscle. So, um, and now let's talk about a, the surplus of dietary protein. So on average, the body needs about one gram of protein per kilogram of body weight. So that's one kilogram, or excuse me, one gram per kilogram per day. So if the person weighs about 132 pounds, that's 60 kilograms, he or she would need to eat about 60 grams of protein per day. So protein powders, protein shakes, protein bars, where does all this excess protein go? So if you'll recall um, what our cells can do with amino acids, option one is we can use the amino acids to build new proteins. And this is the main and most important function um, or option. So the option two is to use amino acids for non-protein building purposes. So one, we could turn amino acids into keto acids and we do that by deanimation. But remember when we use deanimation, we also create a, a dirty fuel, right? Because we're creating ammonia. We can also use keto acids to create ATPs. And then we can use keto acids for gluconeogenesis where we turn them into glucose when blood glucose runs low. And then we can turn the extra keto acids into the acetyl groups and then turn those into fat. So if you remember when we did deanimation, we had a three carbon chain, that's the keto acids. Well, pyruvates are also a three carbon chains. So we can take um, the keto acids and take two of those, convert them into pyruvates and take those pyruvates and change them into glucose. Um, so let's continue with the dietary surplus, pro the surplus of dietary protein. So remember, deanimation of the amino acids yields ammonia, which is a toxin, and it must be eliminated. Okay, so step one is the liver. The, uh, the ammonia is going to be changed to urea, urea. We cannot excrete ammonia as is. It has to be converted in the liver to urea. Step two, in the kidneys, urea is excreted then as urine. So excessive production of urea can cause dehydration because it forces the kidneys to produce extra urine and it pulls water out of our body to excrete the urea. So using protein for fuel actually can dehydrate your body because we have to create more urine and we have to pull water from our body to create that urine. Um, and then let's talk about nutrient deficit. What happens when we don't consume enough calories? So caloric deficit, this is the deficit of macronutrients. Remember macronutrients are going to be our carbohydrates, our proteins, and our fats. Um, and to our body that creates stress. So the body cannot tell if you are dieting on purpose or if you're being forced to starve in a life-threatening situation like the ice age, okay? So the stress of deprivation turns on the secretion of multiple hormones that result in the body's resistance to lose fat. So we're sometimes when we're trying to diet on purpose because we want to lose a little bit of weight, our body doesn't understand that we're trying to do that on purpose. And so actually kind of puts our body into this state that can become resistant to losing fat. So you have to diet um, carefully and you have to do it correctly. So cortisol is normally produced in the adrenal glands. And it gets turned on during stress. It increases blood glucose by inducing gluconeogenesis. So remember, gluconeogenesis is creating glucose from something other than glucose. So cortical, cortisol causes glucose to be made out of our muscle protein. That's the opposite of what we want to do. Muscle protein is needed. It's it helps to burn calories. And so if we're using our muscle, then we're becoming less lean right? And we're losing muscle, which helps us to burn those calories. So um, also it increases the production of insulin. And then the glucose is taken out of the bloodstream and it puts it into the body cell. But the issue is that our muscle that's being used to create glucose creates more glucose than what our body needs at that time. And the cells are only going to use the glucose that they need. And then the rest is either going to be stored as glycogen or it's going to be turned into fat. And so since the cells don't need that much glucose from the ATP, the extra glucose is then now turned into fat. Um, 
Um, <clears throat> so one of the things too that we're going to talk about in a little bit is that high cortisol levels can also suppress one's immune system and that makes them more prone to becoming sick. Uh, cortisol is a steroid hormone um, and it's also used to form cholesterol. Okay, so let's um, do our practice questions on page eight and nine. So number one says, when you eat too much carbohydrates, then the answer would be B, you store some as glucose, or excuse me, as glycogen. And then number two says, some excess glucose can be turned to glycogen. The limit of glycogen storage is, and it's A, about two pounds. After glycogen stores are built to their maximum, excess glucose is converted into, and the answer is C, fats. Um, excess dietary fat is, and it's D, stored as is. <clears throat> Tissue cells can do the following with excess amino acids, except A, store for later. Six says the primary purpose of dietary protein is C, to provide amino acids as building blocks for maintaining new proteins. Um, seven says when amino acids are used for purposes other than building proteins, the following are true, except, and the answer is B, keto acids are excreted as metabolic waste. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about caloric deficit. So the overall effect of caloric deficit is that the muscle mass gets broken down, which is the opposite of what we want. And it's turning it into sugar. And then that sugar is going to be converted to fat, which is exactly the opposite of what we're trying to do when we're dieting. But this is how the body is wired um, to protect itself during the times of famine. Um, so this is due to that high cortisol level and that works against the fat loss. So caloric deprivation is stress to the body. So the cortisol sets up the resistance for fat loss and it ends up hanging on to the fat. Um, so three, it suppresses the body's immune function. So the body is more likely to get infections such as acne, cold, sores, flu, and cold. High levels of cortisol can lead to stomach ulcers. And that's because um, when our immune system is suppressed, it can't fight off the bacteria H. pylori, which lives inside of our stomach. Normally, when our immune system is functioning well, it keeps it from overgrowing and creating those ulcers. Um, it also has been shown to speed up the aging process. So if you've ever seen somebody that's lived a very hard life, you can look at them and they they look a lot older than somebody that maybe hasn't had such a rough life. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about H. pylori because, you, you know, some of you may not have had any medical training or have heard of that before. But H. pylori is usually harmless. It's one of those bacteria that most people do have inside of their, their body. About 50% of people have that in their body. So treatment for H. pylori, we give antibiotics and then we also give an acid reducer type medicine because H. pylori is a bacteria that prefers to grow in a very acidic environment and our stomach has hydrochloric acid. So if we increase the pH, which means we make it less acidic, then the bacteria can't grow as well there. So does cortisol slow down fat storage? Well, the answer is no, it doesn't. All right, so leptin. Let's talk a little bit more about leptin. Um, but before we do that. Let me check and make sure I haven't missed anything just yet. Okay, so hormones produced by the body fat cells. So that's leptin is produced by our fat cells. It goes to the hypothalamus, which is in our brain, and it regulates the metabolic rate and hunger. So it tells us whether um, we're hungry or not, and then how fast we're going to speed up our metabolism. So this is our hypothalamus inside of our brain right here. So um, Fat cells help regulate a body's fat loss or gain by producing more or less leptin. So um, when you eat more, the fat cells produce more leptin. So the in this increases our metabolic rate and then the extra calories get burned off and then we feel less hungry. But during dieting, the fat cells produce less leptin and it slows down our metabolic rate, which is exactly the opposite of what we want to do or the rate of burning calories, and we feel more hungry. So starving, to sum it up hormonally, when, when you are starving, your cortisol levels go up 
And remember when our cortisol levels go up, it increases gluconeogenesis, gluconeogenesis where we're creating glucose from the muscle in our body. And then that excess muscle that's turned into glucose stimulates our pancreas to secrete insulin. The glucose will move from the bloodstream into the cells, but there's going to be a lot of glucose left over because our muscle creates a lot of glucose, more than what our cells need. And then the excess glucose is going to be stored as fat. So we've robbed our, mus our body of muscle, and we've also created more fat. The other issue is that our leptin level goes down, which means we're decreasing our metabolic rate and we're increasing how hungry we feel. Okay, so starvation at the cellular level. Number one, the first thing to go when you are dieting or starving is your glycogen. So once you lose the glycogen with the water in it, you will have lost your first 10 pounds. Um, so this usually happens within the first four to seven days of dieting, and it may seem quite encouraging. So now you know why it's easy to lose that first 10 pounds, because it's mostly glycogen and water. Step two, once the glycogen is gone, the body switches to using fat for energy, and fat need, um, needs to be fed from the fat cells to the muscle. So in order to provide fuel for the muscle, the fat is broken down into acetyl groups, and then these acetyl groups get attached into short molecules that are called ketones. So if you look, you can see here that there's um, one, oops, there's one, two acetyls right here, right? Well, if we combine these together, we have this four carbon chain. Well, this four carbon chain equals a ketone. Um, so ketones get dumped into the blood and transported from fat cells to the muscle. Muscle is the only structure in our body that can use ketones for fuel. There's other um, structures in our body that require glucose, like our brain and our white blood cell and our kidneys and things like that. So the state of the body when ketones are found in the blood is in, and in the urine is called ketosis. So if you heard of the keto diet, most people are wanting to put their body in ketosis. It tells us that they're burning their fat for fuel. When muscle cells pick up the ketones from the blood, they break them down into the acetyl groups and they use them to run through the Krebs cycle, followed by the ETC um, in order to make the ATPs. However, not all tissues in the body can survive on ketones for energy. Certain tissues must have glucose. Um, so these types of tissue are going to be our brain, our red blood cells, and also our white blood cells. Those are just a few. So brain starvation. So remember that we cannot make glucose out of fat. However, we can create glucose by gluconeogenesis from amino acids. But if the body is starving, where will we get the amino acids to make the glucose? And the answer is our own muscle, which is opposite of what we want to do. We want to keep as much muscle as we can because um, there's a lot, they're very metabolic and they help to burn a lot of our calories that, that we're um trying to uh, consume or get rid of. All right, so starvation mode. Step three, the body will start sacrificing muscle protein and break it down into amino acids, then deanimate these amino acids in order to make glucose to feed the brain. So as a result, muscle mass, which is preciously metabolically active tissue, will be lost and your basal metabolic rate will decrease over the course of your dieting period. So here we are trying to lose weight and we're slowing our metabolic rate down. Also, while breaking down muscle protein, extra ammonia will be produced um, from the deanimation of amino acids. So extra urine will have to be produced to excrete the urea, which causes further dehydration. Okay, so let's um, do our practice question. So number one, which of the following does not happen during nutrient deprivation or fasting? And the answer is B, leptin levels increase because they actually decrease. Two, in the first five to seven days of very uh, low calorie diet, it is typical to lose about 10 pounds of weight. So what is the composition of weight loss? And the answer is C, it's mostly glycogen and water. Three, the state of ketosis indicates that and it's D, all of the above. 
Tissues cannot use ketones as sole source of energy and must use glucose, um, and that is seed the brain. When carbohydrates are unavailable and glycogen stores are depleted, this is used as a source of glucose. And the answer is C, muscle protein. After the dieting period is over, the following is true, except, and the answer is D, the body has become leaner. So now let's talk about fad diets. How do these work? So the yo-yo effect of dieting. So each time a person starts a fad diet, he or she comes out of the diet with a lower metabolic rate than going into the diet before. That can must seem very frustrating, right? Um, so most fad diets provide only a temporary state of extreme calorie deprivation, forcing the body into a high cortisol, low leptin regime, and leading to breakdown of muscle and weight loss by dehydration. By the end of the dieting period, the person weighs less, but the percentage of body fat is higher. Because remember, fat weighs less than muscle. Um, and we've lost muscle during that starvation. So because most of the water and the muscle were lost. So that's why we weigh less, but we're also less lean to begin with. All right, so one diet um, that we're gonna talk about is a low carbohydrate diet, um, high fat um, and protein diet. So that's the Atkins diet. Um, so this works by inducing the state of ketosis. So all glycogen is lost first. So that's that first 10 pounds of weight, right? Two, two pounds from the glycogen and then eight pounds for water. So fat stores are used to induce ketosis. So protein is used for fuel, but protein is a dirty fuel because it yields ammonia, which turns the urea turns into urea and it causes dehydration because you have to pee all of that urea out. So uh, the continuous weight loss um, happens by dehydration, not necessarily by um, losing fat. So for healthy pe people, this is not meant to be done for more than three months. Um, after that, it can cause adverse effects on the liver and the kidneys. So this is what I'm supposed to teach you in the nursing world. But the truth of the matter is that if you do clean keto, um, diet, you actually can, it can actually be very healthy for you. It is true that if you do have liver disease, kidney disease, if you have diabetes, then you need to talk to your doctor before you start this particular type of diet, because it can be um, hard on your body. Um, you know, a lot of people think when you do this diet, you get to eat bacon and sausage and fatty, greasy foods. And that's not necessarily true. You have to eat healthy fats like avocado, coconut oil, things like that. Okay, so let's talk about the low fat diet or the very low fat diet or Ornish diet. So this diet was normally prescribed for cardiac patients. Um, and it was designed to remove fat from the food to help decrease fat, which is a leading cause of coronary artery disease. So um, the coronary arteries, if you remember, are the arteries that supply the blood with oxygen. Um, so carbohydrates are refined sugars and are often added to compensate. So what happens is you remove the fat from this diet, but then people start adding more carbs in to, to make the food taste better. Um, low fat tends to be high sugar diets. So remember, this is a problem because if we eat an excess of sugar and we've already stored up our glycogen, then the excess sugar is going to be turned into fat. So carbohydrates with that fat tend to be digested and absorbed into the blood very rapidly, causing a rapid rise in blood sugar. So usually when we're eating carbohydrates, we want to eat them with either a fat or a protein because it helps to sustain that sugar level. If we eat high sugar, we get this rapid rise in our blood sugar, but we also get a rapid fall in the blood sugar. Um, so when we eat the high sugar, while it's high, we don't feel hungry, but then we crash really quickly and then we feel hungry again. So that's the issue with this diet is that we're eating a very low fat diet, but people are compensating with sugar to make it taste better. So they have a rapid rise and then a rapid fall. The problem is we're starting to eat more because we're feeling hungry more often as well. Um, so this rapid increase in blood sugar causes a rapid release in insulin, forcing the cells to uptake that glucose from the bloodstream. And that leads to two things. The cells end up with too much extra glucose, which then gets turned into fat. 
And two, the blood sugar drops just as rapidly as it increased, and that leads to hypoglycemia, leaving the person feeling hungry and then also seeking for more, more food. So what is the best diet? Well, the best diet is a balanced diet. Um, you, you don't want to starve your body to the point where it's stressed out. Um, so they say that you should cut your calories by about 500 calories. Now, when they're saying 500 calories, they're not talking about just food. So 250 of that should be from food and another 250 of that should be from exercise. Um, taking out more calories than that actually put body stress in that starvation mode. And it does the opposite of what you're looking to do when you're trying to lose weight. Um, so energy in versus energy out. Okay, so on page 17, uh, we are not going to go over that. You don't have to know that, okay? You don't have to know page 18. You don't have to know page 19. You don't have to know page 20. And you don't even need to know page 21, okay? Um, so before we go into the nervous system, I know it says that it's an optional reading, but I do want to talk a little bit about why do we gain weight, okay? So one of the reasons um, has to do with evolution and their survival of the fittest. So um, everyone's heard of like Darwin, right? So a lot of times people associate that with um, if people have the intelligence to survive, but it actually has to do with do you have the strong genes that make it possible for you to survive? So during, you know, the dinosaur ages or when we roamed the earth with the saber toothed tigers, okay, our bodies were um, those people that were had the genes that allowed their body to hold on to more fat, they tended to survive more. And so when they procreated, they created more individuals that could um, store fat and use it for later use. And so our bodies um, over time have evolved to um, store fat to be used um, for later times. But it's the reason why we're still here. So those genes that led to a slower metabolism, a predisposition to gain weight, a resistant to late, um, lose weight were the ones that survived and they passed those genes on. Um, so many Native American descendants suffer from obesity and onset diabetes, right? Um, and that's part of their um, genetic predisposition. Um, and also, um, this can also correlate to African Americans who have high blood pressure. Um, and a lot of them are predisposed to that genetically. And part of that is because those genes have been passed on um, from their descendants. So um, when they were on these ships traveling to the Americas, they didn't really stop. They didn't have the opportunity to eat, to drink a lot of water and use the restroom. So the genes that allowed individuals to retain water so they wouldn't become dehydrated were the ones that survived. And then they pass those genes on to their descendants. And so um, it also predisposes them to hypertension. It's important for you guys to understand that because the way that we treat hypertension um, with individuals that are um, uh, African-American are very different than how we would treat um, different ethnic groups um, hypertension because the cause is very different. Also, um, the other thing uh, that I want to talk about with you is the different uh, neurotransmitters that our body produces. Um, so there's some neurotransmitters that give the body a sense of reward, pleasure, and happiness in response to certain types of behavior. And so that, that um, encourages our body to perform the same types of actions again. So um, an example for that would be sexual intercourse, right? Um, so sexual intercourse normally causes the release of dopamine and endorphins in the brain, providing a sense of pleasure and reward. So in this way, humans tend to seek this behavior again. So women, right, we go through childbirth, it's very painful. We know what causes childbirth, but yet we still do that same action that can cause childbirth again, right? Um, so we desire to have that same type of um, behavior again again. Um, this also pertains to eating foods that are high in calories because things that have sugar and fat, they make us feel good, right? That's why a lot of people go to food for comfort and then they seek that behavior again. 
Um, so it's almost like getting addicted to a certain type of drug because it gives you that euphoria. So it is possible for individuals to become addicted to high fat and high sugar foods. Um, and that's because they're actually addicted to the release of that dopamine and serotonin um, that is released in the brain in response to those particular types of food. Um, when I did keto diet at one point, um, I literally felt like I was going through withdrawal when I didn't eat any carbs. It's like my body needed it. Like I felt like I had a physical dependency on those carbohydrates. Once I eliminated them from my body, I didn't have the desire to eat them anymore. But the first two to three weeks were really difficult on my body. Okay, so um, foods that are high in fat can cause the release of dopamine and foods that are rich in sugar and carbohydrates cause the release of serotonin in the brain, which causes us to feel happy, content, and peaceful. Dopamine causes the result of pleasure, reward. Um, so you guys are going to want to know um, what dopamine triggers and also what serotonin triggers in the body as well. And um, we did talk a little bit about cortisol and how it's a stress hormone, but initially it was designed to help us survive, but it wasn't designed to be something that our bodies are exposed to chron over chronically time of period. So a longer period of time, it was meant to, when the bear jumps out and scares us, right. And we need to run, either need to run for our life or we need to fight the bear, right? That's what it's designed to do. But the problem is, is we live very stressful lives right now. And so our bodies can go through chronic stress for a long period of time. Um, it could be divorce. It could be just the regular day-to-day -day stresses. It can be traffic. It could be screaming kids at home. It could be quarantine, COVID-19, right? All of this raises our cortisol level. So it's not the events in our life. Um, that stress us out. It's how we deal with those particular types of stresses. Um, so it's often um, the stress that we create by our own thoughts, by actual events, and also um, the what causes that cortisol release. Um, but there's also things that can increase the amount of cortisol in our body. So sleep deprivation, poor nutrition, uh, taking stimulants like caffeine or energy drinks, those all increase the release of cortisol. So what can you, what can you do to um, eliminate cortisol? We will talk that, about that a little bit later. But cortisol does have specific functions, right? So, and you want to know what they are. So cortisol does make the brain more active. It also increases the release of insulin. Um, which is a bad thing because that makes us more prone to weight gain. And then also increases our blood glucose because it's taking the muscle from our body and creating glucose from it. And then also suppresses inflammation and our immune response, which sometimes can be a good thing because we do use cortisol to help um, with certain conditions that do cause in, um, inflammation in the body. But um, we don't want it to the point where it can cause us to be sick. So um, even though we sometimes can't control some of the things that are going on in our life that can cause stress, there are things that we can do to help manage our stress, right? So don't sweat the small stuff. So it's sometimes it's not easy to manage the way you feel, but if you feel like you have some sort of control over your life and you um, commit to yourself that you're the one in charge, then it can help to decrease that stress level. Stop fighting the things that you cannot change and, um, you know, let go of the things that you really don't have control over. Trying to find peace within yourself. Those are some things that you can do to help decrease those stress levels in your life. So increasing our metabolic rate. If you want to increase your metabolic rate, then the first thing you want to do is stop gaining weight. That's the first thing we have to do. Stop gaining weight. 
before you start losing weight. The next thing that you want to do is to build up muscle because muscle is very metabolic and it can help to increase your metabolic rate, which helps you to burn calories. Also, you don't want to starve yourself to the point where your body is putting you in starvation mode. So remember I talked about how, you know, only decrease your caloric intake by maybe 500 calories. And that means 250, that would be from food and you can exercise the other 250 calories. Um, getting enough sleep, that helps to adjust your um, cortisol level as well. Now, some people may say that they don't require a lot of sleep. They believe they only need about five to six hours of sleep a day. But um, the, the amount of people that that's really true for is very, very minimal. Most people do require sleep. Not getting enough sleep makes you prone to putting on weight. So here's some factors. Remember I talked about what can you do to help with this stress hormone and how can you decrease it? We're going to talk about that now. So make sure you get a good enough, you get good enough sleep that you, make sure you get enough sleep. Sorry, let me speak English correctly, right? Get at least eight hours a day. Only about 3% of people are biologically okay to not to get less than six hours, okay? Get exercise, uh, take a bubble bath. Um, elevating that temperature also releases endorphins, natural opiates, and it can help relax your body and your mind. Um, play with your pet um, or a friend that makes you feel good and calm. Um, this causes a release of oxytocin. So oxytocin is kind of like the bonding hormone. It releases serotonin and it calms you down and it makes you feel happy, content, and that also inhibits the release of cortisol. Also, go outside, take a walk. Sunlight also inhibits the release of the sleep hormone melatonin. And it and if you produce too much melatonin because you stay in the dark most of the time or most of the lights are not bright enough to um, help with that, um, it can cause you to feel depressed. Um, have fun. Do something creative. Um, you know, it can be stressful during this time. There's not a whole lot you can do, but find things that you can do. Um, for me, I know that like gardening has been a real great outlet for me. Um, we bought a new house about two years ago and we've been working on our backyard and, uh, normally my daughter plays, um, travel basketball. So we're gone a lot. So there's not a lot of time to dedicate to that, but I've really enjoyed being in the backyard, getting sun. Um, I've been walking every day because we have more time because we're not traveling to different parts of the United States and California for her, her basketball. So also make sure you eat a balanced diet. So your balanced diet, you need to know this should be about 50% of calories that come from carbohydrates, 30 that should come from fat and about 20% that come from protein. Um, so also when you're trying to lose weight, do not attempt to lose more than a pound in a week. If you lose more than two pounds in a week, then you're pro it's probably that water weight that you're losing and it will come on quickly back if you uh, lose weight too quickly. Um, also that's recommended that you only weigh yourself once a month. Okay, so now let's talk about our nervous system. So our nervous system, the entire nervous system can be divided into two major categories. Um, there's the central nervous system, which is our brain and our spinal cord. So that's what you see kind of like in that teal color. And then our peripheral nervous system is everything else. So all the other nerves in our body are going to be our peripheral nervous system. The only thing that that is part of our central nervous system is our brain and our spinal cord. So neurons, these are um, nerve cells, um, both the central and the peripheral nervous system are composed of neurons. So the neurons is like a one-way wire that carries electrical impulses. We call those electrical impulses action potentials in a single direction, which we learned about before. Um, so our electrical impulse is carried from the head to the toes. Um, when it goes down from the head to the toes, it's carried down one set of wires. When it comes back from the toes toward the head, it goes up a whole another set of wire. Um, and remember, that's because it can only move in one direction. So this is the head of the nerve cell. So impulse starts here and it moves down this way. Then there'd be another nerve cell here. And then these are the dendrites right here. So the impulse would start here. And again, the impulse would continue traveling down the nerve way to the next neuron. 
So there's different types of neurons. There's sensory or afferent neurons. So I always remember with afferent, that means, means the impulse started away from the brain, okay? It started out here. Like if I have a hot stove and I touch the stove and it's hot, it's gonna send a signal to my brain that says, that's hot. That's afferent because the stimulation started away from my brain. Okay. So a sensory or afferent neuron, the neurons that carry action potentials from the organs to the CNS. So from the organs, meaning my fingers to the CNS. Now remember the CNS is just my brain and my spinal cord. Motor neurons or efferent neurons, the neurons that carry action potentials from the CNS, meaning the brain or the spinal cord to the effector organs, uh, effector organs. These organs then carry out the command from the brain. So remember, I talked about the afferent neuron where I touched the hot stove and it sent a message to my brain. That was sensory, right? And afferent started away. It sent a message to my brain that said, that is hot, okay? Then when there's the interneurons, which kind of process that information and it's gonna tell, so it processes the information and says, that's hot, we probably shouldn't touch that. Then the motor or the efferent neurons is gonna tell the muscles in my hand as a reflex to move my hand off of the hot stove. Um, so also let's talk about the reflex arc. You need to know the steps, all five steps of the reflex arc and the order that they happen in. So number one says the receptor or the sensory organ, so my finger, initiates impulse, right? So I touch my finger on the tack, that's number one. The impulse or the action potential is carried up from the sensory neuron toward the CNS. So my finger's touching this and there's a message coming to my brain Okay, so that's the afferent or sensory, and it's gonna analyze the information. So in the CNS, the interneurons analyze the sensory information, and they come up with a response. That's very sharp, okay? Then the response impulse is carried out of the CNS down to the motor neuron. So that says that's sharp, don't touch it, right? So then it sends this message back down here, and then the motor neurons carry out the action potential to the effector organs and the muscles or the glands to carry out the response, which means that I remove my hand from the tack. All right, so neurotransmitters. So the brain chemicals that communicate information throughout our brain and body, they relay signals between the neurons. So the neurons pass impulses to each other and to the effector organs or the muscles or the glands of the body. So the language that cells use to talk to each other are languages of, of chemicals. So these cells release different chemicals or signals to the cells. So um, it's uh, different neurons produce different neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters can tell our heart to beat, they tell our lungs to breathe, they tell our stomach to digest, it can affect our mood, our sleep, our concentration, even our weight. Um, neurotransmitters can include things like dopamine and serotonin and there's others as well. Um, so SSRIs, these stand for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. You're not going to be tested on this, but I just wanted to touch on it because I want you to understand how these medications work when you move into pharmacology. So drugs like Celexa, Lexapro, Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft. So indications for the use of this medication are for de depression, stress, and severe PMS. So what happens with people sometimes that have depression, they have a chemical imbalance. Their body um, doesn't get enough serotonin, okay? So what happens is there isn't enough serotonin that stand that stays in between the the neuro the neuro the uh the receptor sites that are on the neurons and so what happens is these medications so you can see right here there's a medication that's kind of blocking this receptor site right here and then there's serotonin right here. And so it allows for more serotonin to gather between these synapses. So synapses are the spaces between the different neurons. So if we can keep more here, then it allows for more of that serotonin to be absorbed into the body, which helps to elevate one's mood. Okay, so somatic and autonomic nervous system. So the entire nervous system can be divided by somatic 
So somatic means we consciously control it. So that's like our skeletal muscles. And then automatic means we can't control it. It just does it automatically. So somatic nervous system is consciously controlled and it rules the skeletal muscles. It uses a neurotransmitters called acetylcholine or ACH. You might hear us say that as short. So the way that our brain communicates like me moving my arm right now, my brain is sending ACH to those neurons of those muscles telling me to move it this way. That's how they communicate to each other. Autonomic nervous systems, they're self-governing, which means there's no conscious control over it. It's automatic. Um, so automatic neurons innervate all visceral organs. So those are our smooth and our cardiac muscles and all glands. So those are our endocrines and our exocrine glands, right? I don't have to command my thyroid to secrete thyroid hormone. Don't have to command my adrenal glands to secrete cortisol. I don't have to demand my pancreas to secrete insulin. It does it automatically. So the nervous system controls these organs by stimulating and inhibiting the effector organ activities, much like when driving a car. So we're going to accelerate. If we accelerate, we're trying to speed it up. And then if we the brakes are used, we slow it down. So you can't put your foot on the brake and the accelerator at the same time, right? So when one's on, the other one is up. When we put the brake on, the other one, the brake is down and the accelerator is up. Okay, they're not going on at the same time. Um, so I always joke and I like to tell this uh, uh, silly thing sometimes because it helps you guys to remember, but autonomic, right? So autonomic, our stomach, when it digests, I don't will my stomach to digest. I'm not like, go peristalsis now, go, right? It doesn't just, it doesn't work that way, right? Our body just normally starts digesting the food. In fact, sometimes it's kind of quite embarrassing when you're in class and you've eaten lunch and then you're sitting down and your stomach starts grumbling or when you get hungry, right? You can't control that. It has a mind of its own. It's automatic. It's autonomic. So the autonomic nervous system uses two subdivisions. It uses something called sympathetic and then it uses something called parasympathetic. So the sympathetic subdivision uses neurotransmitters called adrenaline. So words that are in red are going to be very important in this chapter, okay? So um, the adrenaline or epinephrine talk to the effector organs, which tells the visceral organs or the muscles or the glands. This is referred to as adrenergic. So when we're talking about sympathetic response, it's an adrenergic response. So when the sympathetic subdivision predominates, because remember when I'm accelerating, the accelerator is predominating. When I back off the accelerator, put my foot on the brake, then that's predominating. So right now we're talking about we're stimulating something to happen, okay? Um, when that happens, we're stimulating our fight or flight response. Um, so imagine someone jumps out and goes, boo, right? What happens to your body when that when they do that? Your heart starts racing. Um, you might start sweating a little bit. Um, and so that's a response to your fight or flight. Or think about when you have to give a speech in front of everyone, right? Your heart starts racing, your mouth kind of goes dry, your palms get sweaty. Um, and then we're gonna talk about some other things that happen when we stimulate that sympathetic response. So when you hear sympathetic response, I want you to think it's an adrenergic response and that secretes adrenaline and it's a fight or flight response, okay? Parasympathetic subdivision uses a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine to talk to the same visceral organ muscles and the same glands. However, it puts the body in a state of rest and digest. So when you think of parasympathetic, I want you to think rest and digest, which is the state of the body when it's relaxing or watching TV or eating dinner. It's also referred to as cholinergic because it uses acetylcholine to communicate with the effector organ. So it's really important that you guys pay attention to this right now because you're going to learn about drugs that stimulate your sympathetic system and you're going to learn about drugs that stimulate your parasympathetic. You're going to hear about drugs that are adrenergic, meaning that it stimulates your sympathetic, or you're going to hear about cholinergic, which means that it stimulates the parasympathetic. Or you might hear of anticholinergic, which means it works against the parasympathetic, which means it's stimulating a sympathetic response. So um, if you understand this right now, it'll help you when you move forward into pharmacology and you're studying that information. 
So when the body is awake, most of the time, a combination of these two states is experienced. So one is predominating at a certain moment and the other is predominating at another moment. So like when we're sleeping, right, our parasympathetic response is going. Um, when we are um, in a fight or flight mode, we're not thinking about how we want to go to McDonald's and get a Big Mac, right? So um, what, they're not usually activated at the same time. Okay, so autonomic, remember that's our fight or flight. It's our sympathetic subdivision. And then our autonomic, things that we can't control, that's our parasympathetic subdivision. And this is our rest and our digest. Um, so I also posted this picture for you. It's in your uh, general forum um, so that you guys can have it. Um, so the reason why I like this map is because it kind of shows you this is our oops, this is our nervous system right here. Okay, so remember we have our sympathetic, or excuse me, we have our central nervous system. So our central nervous system is just our brain and our spinal cord. When we're talking about our autonomic nervous system, that's something that happens with our peripheral nervous system, okay? So, and then there's our motor neurons. So these are the central nervous system muscles and glands. And then we have our somatic and our autonomic, right? So we're so you can see the path and the autonomic is then divided into sympathetic or parasympathetic. So this is our fight and flight, and this is our rest and digest. So you guys also have this on page 31. So when you see everything here in the blue, this is what is turned on or off during parasympathetic. This is what's turned on or off during the sympathetic response. Okay, so our car, these are the different organs right here that are stimulated. So when we're talking about these, when we're talking about the heart, it's gonna say if it's parasympathetic, parasympathetic, we inhibit it. But if it's a sympathetic response, we stimulate it, right? So sympathetics are, are fight or flight, right? So boo, right? Our heart starts, it stimulates our heart to beat faster, right? Um, whereas if we're sleeping, our heart rate actually slows down. So here, our heart rate would decrease, and then here, our heart rate would increase, right? Um, and then vasodilation. So if you have blood in your vessel and it dilates, right, there's not as much pressure inside of the lumen or the tube of your blood vessels. So this actually causes your blood pressure to decrease. And this one causes your blood pressure to increase. So think of a hose, right? And when you put your thumb over the top of the hose, the, the water goes further because when I close the lumen or I make the hole smaller of the tube, there's more pressure, right? So when we cause a vasoconstriction, there's more pressure, which means our blood pressure is going to increase. Um, so with the bronchial walls, that's inside of our lungs, right? Um, during fight or flight, bronchodilation is going to occur. So the tubes that allow air to get into our lungs are going to open up more because it wants to allow for our body to take in more oxygen because we're ready to run from that saber tooth tiger. We're going to need a lot of oxygen in our fight or in our flight. Okay. So we have bronchodilation. Whereas when we're sleeping, our body doesn't require a whole lot of oxygen because we're in a rest or digest state. So GI wall smooth muscles. So remember rest and digest. So anything that has to do with eating has to do with that rest or digest. So it has to be parasympathetic. Um, whereas when we're, when we are going through our fight or flight, remember, we're not thinking about what we're eating for lunch when we're running from the bear that's chasing us. Uh, most people feel nauseous when they're going to have to perform, which stimulates that fight or flight. You get that nervous feeling, a nausea, right? Um, also, accessory digestive organs. Anything that has to do with digestion, so salivary glands, gallbladder, pancreas, that's all part of that rest and digest, right? Anything that has to do with the food. So it's going to be stimulated by that parasympathetic response. Um we're not thinking about that when we're running from whatever it is that's chasing us. So that's going to be inhibited during the sympathetic or the fight or flight response. For our iris, which is the colored part of our eye, 
Um, it's going to dilate when we are stimulating our sympathetic response, our fight or flight. And part of that is to allow more light to enter our eyes so we can see what it is we're running from. But when we're sleeping, we don't want our we don't want a lot of light in our eyes. We're trying to rest. So our pupils are going to constrict, not allow as much light in so that we can rest and sleep. So urinary tract or the urinary tract mucosa, it's inhibited during fight or flight, but it'll be stimulated during the rest and digest, which is why a lot of times you always feel like we have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. And then sweat glands. So when you are having a fight or flight, running from something, you're nervous, you're sweating. But when you're sleeping, we're inhibiting that sweat production. Um, so now, as you remember from our lesson on tissues, as we discussed neurons, a neuron has dendrites that pick up the impulses from sensory organs or preceding neurons, and then the cell body or the soma. So these little structures right here are the dendrites. This whole thing right here is the soma, and it contains the cell's nucleus, which is right here. And then the, we have the axon right here and then the axon terminals, which are down here. And remember that it's the impulses start at the dendrite and they travel down this way to the next neuron. So the dendrites receive the impulses from the preceding neurons. So these would be the, um, the axon terminals right here, right? From the preceding um, neuron right here. So the impulse would travel down the neuron this way here. So these dendrites right here are receiving that information from the preceding, this is the preceding neuron, right? Down this way, okay? All right, so let's do our practice questions on page 33. So it says, which of the following types of neurons stimulate the gastrointestinal tract to contract? So remember, this is rest and digest, and we don't will our stomach to digest. It happens automatically, right? So that's our autonomic B. Which of the following types of neurons pick up the action potentials from the sensory organs and carry the information toward the brain? So remember, this is impulses that are happening away, and then we're carrying that information to the brain. So that's afferent. Um, which of the following parts of the neuron contain the nucleus? And that would be C, the soma. And then number four, which of the following is an effect of the sympathetic nervous system um, stimulation? So remember, this is fight or flight. So that would be B, the pupils are dilating. The rest of them are examples of the parasympathetic. So which of the following belongs in the peripheral nervous system? So remember our, our central nervous system is our brain and our spinal cord. So anything else is gonna fall under that peripheral nervous system. So that would be C, the cyanotic, sci, sciatic nerve, okay? Which of the following is the last step of the reflex arc? And that would be um, D, the effector organ carries out the response. So if you um, forgot, right, on page, 29, it has the steps of the reflex arc, and you guys do need to know um, the different steps of the reflex arc. So let's um, do my practice question. So which of the following is not true about um, metabolism and starvation? The answer would be B. First week of fasting yields 10 pounds of fat loss. Okay, which of the following is correct about glycogen? Um, so A, when the glycogen stores are filled to capacity, the excess glucose will be turned into fat. Um, B, glycogen is meant to be used as an energy source of carbohydrates in case of fasting. Or C, when fasting glycogen is used first. Or D, all of the above. Well, the answer is D, all of the above. A diet high in sugar and simple carbs um, cause which of the following levels to increase? Um, so remember, um, our blood sugar level is going to go up, and that's going to cause the stimulus um, or the release of insulin. 
because we have to move that sugar from the blood into the cells. Also, leptin is a hormone that is produced A, by the brain to burn fat, B, by the fat cells to slow down metabolism, C, by adipose cells to speed up metabolic rate and control appetite, D, by muscle tissues to increase metabolic rate, or E, by fat tissue to stimulate hunger perception by the brain. And the answer is C, by adipocytes, because remember adipocytes are fat cells, to speed up the metabolic rate and control um, appetite. So leptin is not produced in the brain or the muscle tissue. It's produced by the fat cells and leptin regulates our metabolic rate and our hunger perception. So the more leptin, the less hungry you're going to feel. Okay, question five, which of the following is from um, sympathetic stimulation or the fight or flight? And the answer for that would be that the arteries constrict increasing blood pressure. We wanna increase our blood pressure so we can get that uh, oxygen to all the different tissues of our body um, so that we can run if we need to or fight if we need to. So a dog bears its teeth and starts to chase a potential victim, which of the following goes along with the central nervous system response. So this is stimulating our fight or flight. So you have to think about everything that is stimulated during that response. So our heart rate will increase, our blood pressure will increase, our bronchial vessels will dilate, and our pupils will dilate. Rest and digest, or the parasympathetic nervous system includes all except, remember rest and digest, if it has anything to do with digestion, it's gonna fall under this parasympathetic response. But inhibiting GI motility, that is actually part of the sympathetic nervous response because we're not thinking about the cheeseburger, right? When we're running from the bear. Okay, skeletal muscle contraction is stimulated by somatic nerves, autonomic nerves, sympathetic neurons, parasympathetic neurons, or afferent neurons. And the answer is somatic neurons. All right, so um, I'm gonna make a separate video regarding the um, temperature. Um, I appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to the lecture, and I wish you the best of luck on your exam. Have a good night, guys. Bye.